Welcome back. This is our third panel today on illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. All conference materials are available for download at the bottom of the events page, and there's a link to that in the chat. This conference program has the full bios available and the agenda for today. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Naval War College YouTube page after the event. I really look forward to this talk today on IUU fishing with our experts. Our moderator is Commander Michelle Shallop. Commander Shallop serves as a special assistant to the 32nd Vice Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. She has completed five afloat tours, including plank owning commanding officer of U.S. CGC Cobaya, an 87 foot patrol boat in Mobile, Alabama. She was commanding officer of U.S. CGC Spar, a 225 foot seagoing buoy tender in Kodiak, Alaska. And most recently, as executive officer of USCGC Healy, a 420 foot medium icebreaker in Seattle, Washington. Commander Shallop holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Central Michigan University, a Master of Public Administration from Grand Valley State University, and a Master of Arts with distinction from National Security and Security Stud Strategic Studies from the US Naval War College. She is an alumni. Please join me in welcoming Commander Shallop as she leads this third panel on IUU fishing. Thank you, Commander Cameron. I have the honor today of moderating a panel with subject matter experts on illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or IUU, fishing, and how these practices are affecting the global maritime strategic environment and what that means for our navies and coast guards. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to provide some administrative guidance that will sound familiar. All comments reflect the positions of the speakers and attendees and do not necessarily reflect the official position of the U.S. Naval War College, the Department of the Navy, or the U.S. government. Please keep your microphone and cameras off. Please post all questions and comments in the chat for question and answer period after the presentations. The biographies of all of our speakers are available in the conference program. This panel has three distinguished speakers. Our first presenter is Dr. Ife Sinachi Okafor Yarwood, lecturer in sustainable development at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Her work advances an interdisciplinary understanding of oceans sustainability and criminality as a question of resource management, environmental justice, and the disproportionate effects of depleting marine resources on equality, poverty, and insecurity. As a reminder, her full biography, as well as that of our other two panelists, can be found in detail in today's program. Welcome to the panel, Dr. Okafor Yarwood. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen and then start the presentation. So today I'm going to be talking about the complexities of IU fishing, the African experience. Whilst the focus of today's presentation is seemingly on Africa, and by the end of today's presentation, you get to understand why, given that we're working with the theme of human security. I have also provided some global perspective to help us contextualize the extent of a problem from the global level. And in looking at this subject, given that we have human security to work with, I'm going to be starting today's presentation by paraphrasing this quote that is attributed to Admiral Don Fisher in 1904. He noted, if we lose command of the sea, it is not invasion we must fear, but starvation. Although he was speaking about this in the context of the threat that the Navy faced at the time, this is actually the reality of millions of people across the globe, many of whom are on the African continent who depend on fisheries for livelihoods. And so today we're going to be talking about IU fishing as a threat to human security. And actually by the end of today's presentation, you get to understand why it is also by extension, a threat to national, regional and global security and not just a, a human security thing. And so what is illegal fishing? It represents activities that are consistent with or in conservation of the management or conservation measures enforced for a particular fishery management or conservation measures, either put in place by a state 
or a regional fisheries uh, management organization. It is mostly conducted by vessels without nationality or vessels flying the flag of a non-party state to a regional organization. It can manifest by fishing without authorization, fishing with a vessel without a flag, fishing in an enclosed areas, including um, MPAs, fishing in inshore waters, you know, maybe fishing with authorization, but in areas that is restricted to the vessel, and also fishing for prohibited species. So why is this even a problem? Why should we be talking or focusing on IE fishing? Why not something else? Well, we're focusing on IE fishing, not just because of the significant contribution that fish make or fisheries product makes for livelihoods and providing employment for millions of people globally, but it's also because of the fact that it exacerbates the depletion of fish stock. So take, for example, already globally, the marine environment is grappling with the impact of marine pollution. And I'm going to draw some example from the Niger Delta area of Nigeria. The extent of oil pollution in the Niger Delta area is such that 42% of the mangrove of the Niger Delta is oiled. And of course, this is very problematic because research has shown that about 60% of the species that breed in the Gulf of Guinea or the fishery species in the Gulf of Guinea breed in the mangrove of the Niger Delta. So it automatically means that anything that un undermines the sustainability of fish stock in the Niger Delta is in itself a threat to the food security of countries in the Gulf of Guinea, because of course we recognize that fisheries is migratory in nature. There's also the threat of uh, toxic waste dumping by multinational oil companies and, and also um, uh, foreign um, trawlers from, from foreign countries and, and also the intentional or illegal also unintentional sometimes dumping of toxic waste. And some of you might recognize this, um, the image of this vessel on the screen of Probo Cola from 2007, which illegally dumped toxic waste in Côte d'Ivoire although the impact of the waste is not as extensive as it was in 2007, but the impact is still felt in some, some of the communities that were affected in the Ibrié Canal region of the Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire. And then when we look at illegal fishing and its extent in West Africa alone, some research has shown that it amounts or it represents up to 40 to 65% of the legally reported catch, making the region the IU fishing capital of the world. In comparison, if you look at it from the global perspective, there are also so many other regions that grapple with this threat, but not to the extent that West Africa does. And then we have the impact of climate change. According to a 2017 report by the World Bank or blog by the World Bank, unless something is done to manage fishery species, and of course, if the sea level continue to rise, by 2050, the fisheries resources and the waters of West Africa is going to be halved. In Nigeria, I talked about up to, by up to 53% in Nigeria, up to 56% in Côte d'Ivoire, and up to 60% in Ghana. This is of course very problematic, given that research has shown that up to 50% of the fisheries in the waters between Nigeria and Senegal is currently already overexploited. So that gives you the extent of the problem and the reason why we, we are right to be focusing on illegal fishing as a threat to not only human security, but by extension, national and regional security. There's also the threat of legal fishing, because in a lot of the times we talk about illegal fishing and sometimes it sort of excuses the fact that through legal agreement, countries and distant water fleets are also targeting fishery stock or fish stock that are already overexploited and therefore exacerbated the extent to which some of this stock is, is, is um, sort of um, being going near to extinction and undermining livelihood for local communities and not allowing time for it to regenerate. There's also the threat of the blue economy or the development of the blue economy. As so many countries, not only on the African continent, but also in Latin America and Asia and the Caribbean are becoming more aware of the potential of the resources within their um, ocean environment. They are becoming more interested in exploiting the ocean environment, developing the ocean environment, in either through tourism, expansion of port infrastructure, all these things together exacerbates the threat to fishery sustainability. And the people that suffer are the fisher folk who 
every day have to grapple with the fact that the fish stock that they're able to exploit is reducing due to all these activities I've highlighted. And so now we're coming back to illegal fishing or the reason why illegal fishing is also very important for us to study from a global perspective. According to the FAO in 2020, in 1990, the fish stock in terms of the biological sustainability level of the global fish stock was 90%. By 2017, the biological sustainability level is 65.8%. That is of course worrying given that it's now four years since this data was produced. It is probable that given uh, the fact that not much has been done at the global level to ensure sustainability, that this level might have reduced or become worse from the level we're seeing presently. And then if we're looking at the cost or the global cost of illegal fishing, again, FAO in 2015 noted that illegal fishing cost the global community between 10 to $23 billion each year. On the African continent, in 2013, the former president of the African Union noted, Madame Zuma, she noted that in the last 50 years, the continent had lost up to 200 billion to illegal fishing. This was in 2013. And then in 2017, a research noted that five West African countries lose an estimated 2.3 billion each year to illegal fishing. Those countries include Mauritania, Senegal, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. At the global level, I've already talked about illegal fishing amounting or representing 40 to 65% of legally reported catch in West Africa. So you can see how it compares to the global level where it accounts for an estimated 20% of a legally reported catch. So this is absolutely something that is very worrying and something that warrants looking at when we're looking at you know, generally threats at, this, at sea and how it impacts not only the human people that rely on this um, fishery stock for subsistence, but also the states that might rely on the revenue um, for their development. And so why does this happen? Why does illegal fishing happen? So many people have already hinted the reason for this in the course of their presentation. It happens due to lack or limited of enforcement capacity. It happens due to lack of uh, state interest in the sector, due to a flag of convenience, you know, foreign vessels taking advantage of uh, the minimal regulation or cheap reg re um, registration in select countries. It happens due to corruption. It happens due to greed. And it also happens due to politics. And in general, you know, the lack of authentic, you know, when we talk about this as a global problem, but when it comes to solving the problem or the threat to sustainability, nations are actually very individualistic in the way that they solve this problem because they end up exporting their unsustainable practices elsewhere in the cause of trying to ensure sustainability at home. So in fact, the way sometimes the global community look at, at it on paper, they look at this threat as a global problem, but in practice, the way that nations actually try to solve this problem, they're very um, individualistic and nationalist in the way they try to solve the problem. And I'm going to focus on the next slide, the politics of this thing that also makes it very complex when we're talking about illegal fishing. What exactly amounts to illegal fishing? And can state easily contest it? Or is this also about power? And I'm focusing on this example because it's very recent. And a lot of the time, this is something that is cited when you talk about, oh, illegal fishing has happened. And then the, the next question is, but well, what is the legal uh, definition of it and what is the legal contest that this thing has happened. And I'm focusing on this because in 2019, an NGO CFA noted or made a complaint to the European Union that an Italian vessel has encroached the Sierra Leone um, inshore waters up to six up to six Italian vessels. And so they wrote to DG Mare, this is the European Union Maritime um, Department, to question it. But then by 2021, the DG Mara's legal department responded, noting that no legal activity of the operators can be proven in this instance. Their reason, the lack of exact nautical maps for the limitation of Sierra Leone IEZ creates difficulties in identifying the actual legal activity 
from those being carried out outside the IEZ. And this is very problematic because as we know, there is no wall that delineates you know, the, 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 the ocean and therefore making this kind of argument is something that vessels that already have legitimate rights to operate in any nation can make when they are talking about, well, especially when we're talking about illegal fishing that involves encroachment of um, internal exclusive economic zone, which unfortunately is actually some of the types of illegal fishing that we're seeing in Western Central Africa, and also increasingly constant conflict um, between the trawlers in question and the, the local communities who feel that their fish is being taken by those that sometimes have legal right. We're not talking about those that actually encroach the waters or the EEZ to fish without authorization. And then what is the human security implication of all these things that is happening? What are the impacts? So we look at this from this perspective. According to a World Bank report, generally, and due to the general impact of depletion, the income of fisher folk or artisanal fishers on the African continent have reduced by up to 40%. And so as a result of this, a lot of fishers are either leaving the fish trade um, to migrate to the cities, sometimes legally, sometimes illegally. And then we see some of these examples being manifest in the cases of Senegal. A lot of fisher folk are actually openly abandoning fish trade and leaving for Europe. And when you ask them, they say that the vessels have come and taken our fish. Now we're flowing them back to Europe. This is a very common example that has been cited by some of the fisher folks that have migrated try, or try to migrate from Senegal to Europe. A lot of them also engage in illegal fishing in turn by fishing with dynamite, fishing in areas that is restricted, or fishing close to the oil pipelines. And sometimes the risk of accident is then accelerated. And then when there's actually an accident, we see the cycle of this, you know, the, the pollution from the accident, the cycle of depletion repeats itself. Some of them borrow money to, to diversify their income. Sometimes they actually borrow money from the wrong people, which actually also exposes them to threat and also exposes them to criminal actors who might then use it or try to use it as a leverage to say, okay, you can use your experience to do this at a very limited risk. Given the importance of fish stock or fishery species for women, given that over 80% of fishery species is actually marketed by women in West Africa, unfortunately, a lot of women in, in trying to ensure guaranteed supply are exchanging or pressured into exchanging sexual favor in exchange for ensuring steady supply. We also see fisher folk using their, um, their boats to, to traffic drugs like manganese or, or cannabis, and sometimes even engage or collide with bigger criminal actors to, to traffic drug, to tra um, transshipment at sea or pick up drugs at sea. We also see them acting as arm robbers or look out for pirates indirectly, um, which also equates to engaging with um, engaging in piracy directly, especially if they are at the higher level of the criminal network. Another very common um, examples of some of the things criminals uh, Fisher folk have been known to engage in is illegal oil bunkering or even pipeline vandalization. And for them, it's just a thing of, well, we have to make a living somehow. And these are the realities of today. These are the things that they cite. And these are the reasons that they cite as the motivation behind some of the act. But looking beyond the illegal fishing, it was very common for me not to present this um, this graph, but I thought it was necessary to present it because some of the speakers I've already spoken have highlighted piracy as a problem. And I'm sharing this graph just for us to know that even though the lack of uh, monitoring surveillance and control might have inhibited the ability of a lot of uh, the regional navies or regional agencies to actually be able to catch some of these vessels in the act. This is something that maritime enforcement agents have cited, that there is a correlation between illicit activities at sea, including um, illegal um, oil bunkering, for example, or illegal fishing and piracy and Amrabi at sea. And I'm sharing this data just for you to see on, on the chat here. The first one is relates to Panofi frontier. It was attacked on the 24th of June in, of the coast of Ghana in 2020. But before it was attacked, you have to look at this map that, look, that sort of 
highlights its activities or movement. It has an authorization to fish in Ghana, right? And whilst this particular incident might not be directly linked to illegal fishing because it cannot be proven, because if it is not what the Navy is looking at or if they're not working with the fisheries department, they might not necessarily be able to point this out. But you can see the, the way that is operating out and about different areas might suggest or raises suspicion, but this is not proven in terms of whether it was attacked at the time, whether it was engaging in illegal activities or illegal fishing because it has not been investigated. Another one that highlights the reason why we should be looking very carefully about the potential link between illegal fishing and piracy, for example, is the attack on February 25th, sorry, February 7th, 2001 of the coast of Gabon. This vessel, um, Le Pendu 809, was attacked in the border between Gabon and Sao Tome. It doesn't have a license authorization to fish in Sao Tome. It has, um, it's flying the flag of Gabon, but interesting thing is that it was around an MPA, a marine protected area in Gabon. It shouldn't be fishing there. It shouldn't be there on a good day. But again, it is not proven that it's fishing illegally because I do not know whether the investigation is actually carried forward because it might be that it's not within the remit of the Navy to do this. But the possibility that vessels that might be engaging in illegal fishing are actually captured. And as in the case of this particular vessel, used subsequently to attack other vessels is one of the reasons why, even looking at it beyond the threat that it poses on the environment, we should actually also be looking at it from the perspective of, if we actually succeed in combating illegal fishing, could we also succeed in reducing the extent of piracy attack globally, not only in the Gulf of Guinea? And this is why I've highlighted this. The case of uh, Hei Lung Peng is also one that is, word, is noteworthy because it was rescued um, by the Nigerian Navy through collaboration with the Ivorian and the Yaoundé architecture. But something that's very interesting about this is that this actually happened through collaboration between the fisheries agency in Cote d'Ivoire, supported by the fisheries task force of the fisheries um, um, committee for West Central Gulf of Guinea. But another interesting thing is that in June, the Nigerian government through Nemasa would subsequently find Haif and Lung for being around Nigerian EEZ so many times with its AIS switched off, that is its um, vessel monitoring system switched off. It didn't have any business been in that area because it doesn't have fisheries arrangement to fish in Nigeria. I'm running out of time, but I just want to talk quickly about what the government are doing to solve this problem or trying to address this problem. Unfortunately, still in the spirit of talking about human security, a lot of the effort to address this problem ends up targeting the already vulnerable. In Ghana, for example, we see the Ghanaian government um, suspending um, um, premise fuel for four villages because they were supposedly engaging in light fishing when last year in 2020, the same government was given authorization to tuna vessels to actually break the law and write into the Navy to allow the same tuna vessels or to, to allow tuna fishing fleets to fish with, to engage in light fishing, something that is illegal by law. The people protested. And of course, with the Navy intervening, the government had to cancel that decision. We also see this in, in, in Bangladesh, for example, whereby effort to ensure the regeneration of depleting fish stock is targeting on the local people, the already vulnerable by instituting fishing bans, something that has been tried in Ghana. But the fact that these people are the ones that are already vulnerable, they are targeted, they are not compensated, and they are expected to stay at home for a month, two months without doing anything. This actually presents an opportunity for this vicious cycle of vulnerability, possibly resulting in criminality, to actually thrive because um, criminal actors are likely to take advantage of people that have the knowledge of the sea, that are vulnerable, and also looking for ways to, to make ends meet. And so what is the solution without taking photo of your time? Maritime enforcement is absolutely important. The use of armament is very important because there are a lot of criminal actors that are actually in this business just because of the sheer greed and the fact that they can make money from it. But at the same time, we cannot solve this problem looking at it from a holistic perspective without centering coastal well-being, without centering the need for environmental conservation. And this would only happen when we also recognize that the local communities have a role to play in solving this problem. Local CSOs have a very important 
important role to play in solving these problems. Um, thank you so much for listening and I apologize for um, taking so much of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okafor Yarwood. If you have questions for her, please enter them into the chat now and I'll be happy to ask them of her at the conclusion of our third panelist. Our next panelist is Rear Admiral Scott Clendenin, United States Coast Guard Assistant Commandant for Response Policy. In this role, he is responsible for US Coast Guard policy in seven operational mission areas, including law enforcement and maritime security. Immediately preceding this, oper this assignment, excuse me, Admiral Clendenin served as the Coast Guard Liaison Officer to the newly established Interagency Transnational Organized Crime Strategic Division. Welcome, Admiral Clendenin. Well, good morning and uh, th thank you very much uh, to the Naval War College for inviting me to speak about this uh, very important mission set for the Coast Guard. Um, and uh, really, really appreciate the opportunity to network, not just uh, with uh, US colleagues who are interested in this field, but international as well, because this really is a, a team effort. Um, the Coast Guard itself uh, has, has been engaged in, um, in, in fisheries enforcement for 150 years. And uh, that's enforcing the, the laws of, uh, of fisheries throughout our 3 million square mile exclusive economic zone and in areas, key areas of the, of the high seas. Um, I think for, uh, for purposes of my, my brief discussion, I, I would, uh, uh, I really appreciate the doctor's detail and summary of the concern and the security concern involved with IUU. We share uh, her passionate concern about this this issue, and I think uh, through all your speakers, it's been noted that this is not just confined to Africa, but this is a worldwide concern. And so, what I would like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about what the U.S. Coast Guard and our interagency colleagues are doing to work together uh, to to address this um, uh, across the world. Um, so the way this began actually was in Newport, Rhode Island uh, in, in many ways, because uh, Admiral Schultz, our current commandant, when he was area commander, uh, visited uh, the International Sea Power Symposium as our Coast Guard representative. And as usually happened in that forum, the navies and Coast Guards normally would approach us on the, on the largest maritime concerns uh, in our field of work in the Coast Guard. And typically that was search and rescue, drug interdiction, counterterrorism, piracy. Uh, and, and that was kind of what we were prepared to be approached on. And in that case, in that year, uh, there was, it was noted that there was a large, large increase in interest in, in discussing IUU and how the nations and the navies and Coast Guards could band together to counter what was a growing plague and concern uh, across the world. And uh, so when he became commandant and he continued to receive uh, that type of feedback from our international partners, he guided us to, to draft and build uh, a strategic outlook uh, for IUU fisheries. And then uh, subsequently, we also drafted an implementation plan on your screen you'll see a reference at the bottom. These are actually available online. These are meant to be collaborative documents, not just for ourselves, but for our partners. It paints our way ahead in the way in which uh, we intend to address IUU. Um, within that strategic outlook, I'll, I'll just briefly outline three lines of effort. Um, the first one is, uh, and, and we always say we're focused on intelligence uh, driven operations. Um, the first line of effort is to promote targeted, effective, and intelligence-driven enforcement operations. Um, th this is uh, a unique challenge. Uh, I would say that the U.S. does not have all the, the information it needs for this. So is th this is not only coordinating information sharing across the interagency and across our intelligence community, but in many ways, 
It's about building uh, the collaborative, collaborative systems uh, for the private sector and NGOs uh, to share information as well. In many ways, the most important information, as we saw in the doctor's presentation, will come from other, other, uh, other sources of information that we can collaborate and share to build a common international picture of uh, the prevalence of IUU uh, fishing concerns. The, uh, the, the second uh, line of effort is to uh, counter predatory and irresponsible state behavior. And we believe any, any nation that has, uh, that flags vessels that uh, sail uh, around the world are also responsible if those flag states uh, have, uh, are operating outside the norms of expected behavior internationally. And so how can we, uh, when we recognize irresponsible state behavior, first work with the, the flag nation uh, that, that's responsible for those vessels and let them know what we are seeing and what other nations are reporting as far as irresponsible behavior. But also, uh, if, if in fact there is not a response, um, how, how do we collaborate internationally to bring pressure and to, uh, to change the behavior of those vessels so that they enter into expected norms of behavior and comply with international agreements uh, that pertain to fisheries and, and other uh, activities at sea. And so our third line of effort is to expand the multilateral fisheries engagement cooperation. Uh, as we know, we have uh, regional uh, fisheries management organizations and they have uh, long-standing agreements internationally uh, that allow us to collaborate in fisheries enforcement and monitoring. Uh, we are working with all our international partners and have spoken with many of them that would like to see increased provisions for boardings on the high seas for us all to mutually ensure that we have uh, fair grounds for, for fishing and that all fishermen uh, at sea uh, in the high seas and in other territorial seas uh, are conforming to uh, international standards uh, for for fishing, um, and I think uh, you know we we see that through boardings, through increased enforcement, as the doctor uh, talked to in the end of her presentation, uh, through increased presence on these vessels, um, we will understand more about the patterns of illicit and uh, and and poor behavior of the IUU actors at sea so that we can take uh, additional steps uh, to address it. And so I think the theme that you see here is there's, there's no one nation, there's no one agency that can address this alone. Um, it's gonna have to be uh, worked through uh, collaboration of all nations uh, in, and really uh, take on this issue. issue. I think throughout your, your talk, you see the extent and the concern that's building, and it's only getting worse as, uh, as time goes on. One of the large approaches we take is to build uh, through international multilateral, but also bilateral agreements to allow us to work with nations to help them as well for enforcement uh, of, of concern, of IUU concerns around their waters, um, but also sometimes with their agreement and their teams embarked in collaboration with us, help them enforce uh, the law within their own waters, uh, which is helpful internationally since fish don't have passports and the, and the impact of illicit fishing anywhere uh, can, can impact the global stock everywhere. So, um, so we've uh, internationally, we've, we've had a whole lot of uh, international initiatives um, really across the world to, uh, to include Africa. Uh, since 2011, uh, in working with our African partners, um, we've, we've cited more than 120 violations of domestic uh, fisheries law inside their exclusive economic zones and partner with those nations. 
Uh, in the Atlantic, we recently sailed one of our newest vessels down there and collaborated it with the region uh, on, on IUU fishing in that region and uh, really generated a lot of interest and, and good diplomatic discussion uh, from their, their efforts down there. Uh, noting my colleague on the panel from Ecuador, uh, we have worked with Ecuador closely in the area of IUU in collaboration and the real gem that they have, their national treasure of the Galapagos Islands and their EEZ that is so important to the region. And uh, we hope to continue to collaborate with Ecuador on that in the coming, coming years. In the Pacific Island countries, we had Operation Blue Pacific, which worked with the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, and then of course we uh, always do the North Pacific Guard each year with Canada, Japan, South Korea, and our own uh, agency of NOAA. One of the vehicles that we use to coordinate domestically within the United States is the SAFE Act. And uh, so uh, I'm the Coast Guard chair on that uh, with my colleagues and NOAA that lead that effort. There are actually 21 federal agencies. We meet regularly to take action to curtail the global trade in seafood, seafood products derived from IUU fishing. And the effort in that working group uh, includes um, a whole of government effort for, for data sharing, as we discussed here, support uh, of priority regions, increased uh, transparency and traceability across global seafood supplies, uh, improved global enforcement operations, and uh, to prevent the IUU fishing profits as a financial source for transnational criminals. And that's a very important organization, very helpful organization. And so, um, so that, that's uh, basically the framework. And I, I look forward to the questions and again, really appreciate this very important discussion against a, a mission that our commandant has had us very focused on. And uh, thank you again, I'll, I'll turn it back over to the moderator, thank you. Thank you, Admiral Clendenin. Our third panelist today is Commander Carlos Garzon of the Ecuadorian Navy. Commander Garzon has served as commanding officer of two Ecuadorian Marine battalions located near Ecuadorian North and South borderlines. Thank you for joining our panel today, Commander Garzon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me share my, my screen. Can you see it, uh, please? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, then uh, it's an honor to be here. I will begin uh, just uh, located my country. We are in South America in the Pacific Ocean between Colombia and Peru. And because of the Galapagos Islands and its unique economic exclusive zone, plus the continental EEC, we are four times and more uh, water than land. And then that is so important for our uh, resources. Uh, today, I'll, I'll be address about the importance of the fisheries in my country, the problem, the solution, and the experiences. And you will see the solution not just as a Coast Guard uh, effort, not even as a Navy, but as a country's uh, all sources of power, which is diplomatic, informational, military, and also uh, economic. The, the last one is not going to be presented by my country experience because uh, we are still working to have this as a source of power. So why uh, is important the fishery in, in Ecuador? The main income from exportation, the first place is uh, oil, and the second and third is always a, a fight against agriculture and fisheries. In agriculture, the premium products uh, of Ecuador is the banana and uh, coffee. But in fisheries, the main uh, products are uh, tuna and shrimp. Uh, speaking about tuna, we are the world's second fleet uh, uh, country. And uh, approximately, um, around 1,100 fishery ships or 
more than 20 gross resistors tonnage, which allowed them to uh, industrially uh, fish in our economic exclusive zones. But also uh, we have uh, more like 2000 artisanal fishing boats that they create the work uh, for, for the people in the region, in the coastal region. We are the world's second tuna export country. Uh, and last year we uh, produced $1,500 million. Also 1.6% is of our, our gross domestic product comes from the fisheries and it allows to enable so more than 500 industries around fisheries. So uh, why is it is important the fisheries? Because it's a sources of food, a sources of work, uh, uh, ship work, shipyard development and uh, uh, exportation incomes also. So it's important for us. The problem as uh, operational factors, I'll address the space. And then we have um, the coastal of Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands. You can see the red dots uh, around the economic exclusive zone. These are other countries' fisheries fleets. The problem is when they go inside of our economic exclusive zone. So we have to monitor in, uh, them. And also sometimes they turn off their um, identification devices and becomes uh, like dark vessels. Uh, another point uh, in space is the distance. The distance between the uh, Western side of uh, continental Ecuador to the uh, Western side of Galapagos Islands is 640 nautical miles plus the 200 uh, nautical miles. It's around 840 nautical miles and on that our resources, Navy and Coast Guard uh, uh, should be monitoring uh, this uh, problem. In the, is the time factor with the, the historical data, the, sh the Fishes moves uh, following the, the roads of their um, uh, sources of, of, of food. So we can see, for example, in, in January, the concentration of the fishers are in South uh, uh, continental Ecuador near to uh, Peru. Uh, in May is the opposite, north of my country and near uh, to Colombia. And next month, for example, they are all the most uh, concentrated uh, fisheries are in the farthest point of my economic exclusive uh, zone. So uh, the force, what is uh, our main threat? The, the fleets that are doing illegal fishing. And one of the most important um, uh, threat is the Chinese uh, uh, fishing fleet because it's big and because we have a history of, of uh, having them around our, our economic exclusive uh, zones. So we uh, um, address the critical vulnerabilities. They have a long uh, sea lines of communications. They need fuel and they need uh, refrigerators to carry their products to, to the, their mainland. Uh, speaking about the tankers and their uh, reefers, we monitor them and we know that they normally goes in and out the mainline China, but often, as you will see in the right um, um, picture, they go uh, also with uh, South America countries also, and not only in the Pacific, but also in the Atlantic. So what's the solution? Once again, it, it's, it will be a dime solution in the diplomatic uh, sector. We are um, having coordinations between our Ministry of uh, Production, External Commerce, Inversions and Fisheries with um, organizations such as a Food and Agriculture Organization, the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, the Permanent Commission for the South Pacific, the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization, and we are part of the International Plan of Action to prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Also, with our Ministry of uh, External Affairs, we are having um, a diplomacy conversations with the government of uh, China. Uh, the solution is uh, sharing information also. We uh, share information internal for our 
own uh, fishery fleets, the, the Ecuadorian Navy shared the vessel monitoring and the statutory documents. Uh, the Undersecretary of the Fishery Resources also um, shared the fishing permits and the fishing traceability. Our um, oil companies, um, public, uh, shared the gas stations uh, uh, for boats, the amount of, of fuel that provides to the boats, and the internal rent services um, shared the billing for the fuel. With that information, we can uh, monitor if something is wrong with, with this kind of information, we could track and, and follow not just illegal fishing, but the other um, illegal activities. What happened with the uh, international uh, fleets? We have projects in the informational source of power against uh, that uh, IUU fishing. Um, for example, with World Wildlife Foundation and Global Fishing Watch as an NGO, but also with partner nations. In this example, with Canada and United States, for example, with Canada, we have a cooperative situational and informational integration system. And with United States, uh, we allow to use uh, our Galapagos as a place uh, for uh, the operation of the P3 Orion for maritime patrol and reconnaissance and to have the information that they, they provide uh, for us. In the military um, factor or uh, source of power, the surveillance and control capacity, capacity is not just monitoring, but also to go out with our resources. And we um, are help, help with the ISS systems and for our international, um, uh, the international fleet, we use the ISS with sat, uh, satellite capacity to mon monitoring uh, the international uh, fleet. Once again, uh, it's not just monitoring from uh, a desk, we have to be there. So for that, we have operational response centers, which use um, Coast Guard, um, Navy ships, uh, naval aviation, even Marines, if we have to do a non-cooperative non um, uh, abordance of the of the ship and we also track the critical capabilities which are the tankers and the river uh, rivers as i told you and since 2019 we develop a virtual exercise multinational which is called galapex with um, our allies and partner nations to begin thinking about what to do in the case of this illegal, unreported, undeclared fishing will become a, a regional and world uh, a threat. So that's why, why uh, we do it. And last uh, thing I will address is the experiences or last experience with that with uh, one ship from China. It was a reeler. Uh, it was captured in 2017. Um, it was uh, 13 nautical miles of one of uh, Galapagos Islands. So Navy sent a Coast Guard and a helicopter. And as soon as they, they, they aboard the, the ship, they found um, sharks and, and, and fins of the uh, sharks. So they processes the ship. Right now, the ship is donated for the Ecuadorian Navy and the crew is in jail because of the envir environmental uh, crime. This is an example of how can we address uh, just with our nation effort. But once again, if we have to deal with it, uh, we have to do uh, all sources of power, not just uh, an effort of one country. Uh, thank you for uh, your time. I'm waiting for the, the questions. Thank you very much, Commander Garzon. And thank you to all our panelists for your time and insight today. I invite all of our speakers to go on camera for our question and answer session for the next few minutes. If those in attendance have not already done so, I invite you to start posting your questions or continue to post your questions within the chat. We do have uh, one question to uh, start off with, and this will be for you, Admiral Clendenin. It ties a little bit into the diplomatic uh, solution that Commander Garzon spoke to uh, just recently. With the first line of effort in the strategic outlook, what role 
does information sharing play in IUU fishing? And how does the Coast Guard envision that information will be shared? And how will it have an impact? Sir. Well, well thank, thank you for the question. Um, and that's, again, uh, probably the, the most important line of effort is to get the intel and info sharing uh, right. And, uh, um, and it's uh, so part of that is within the interagency, the U.S. interagency, whenever we have a new mission set, we consider how are we going to share our information between our own agencies. But in the IUU framework, as we heard the commander uh, talk about, there are many uh, other sources of information that, frankly, in some ways are better informed as to the illegal activity in the IUU mission space. Those include NGOs. He mentioned uh, 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 Global Fishing Watch and uh, the World, World uh, Wildlife Federation. Um, also other nations, Ecuador obviously is very informed as to what's happening in the region uh, as far as fishing, uh, fishing, uh, uh, IUU fishing. And so um, how do we uh, combine that information in a collaborative platform? where uh, everyone can enrich the understanding of the problem set and share that information and provide transparency for where the fishing fleet is, where irregular activities, such as when, if a ship turns off, it's AIS just outside of the EEZ of Ecuador or some other nation, uh, so that um, we can uh, understand where the illicit fishing is happening and together uh, use our resources to, to go ahead and uh, board and document uh, that activity. Um, in, in the case, Ecuador showed some real uh, success stories uh, with, uh, with their ability to board within their own seas. They have their, obviously have their authorities over their EEZ and, and, and that's a successful outcome. Or it may be that we approach the vessel uh, we board and we see, and then we share it with the flag state through diplomatic channels. Um, the one, one thing of note I just offered everyone is uh, that we are working with both the private sector NGOs, but also with our own agencies. In fact, the Defense Innovation Unit right now has a contest for building a collaborative platform on how all these entities could better uh, share information and look for uh, anomalous behavior that may be indicative of IUU out there. So, um, so I, I, I thank you for the question, a very important one, and I think that's how we would get after that. Thank you, Admiral. Our next question is for Commander Garzon, and it's uh, very much in the Naval War College Joint Military Operations um, Nexus. According to your operational approach to IUU fishing, what do you see as Ecuador's center of gravity? And what do you see as the Chinese fleet's center of gravity? Commander? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the center of gravity uh, to address the illegal fishing will be the Korean Ecuadorian Navy itself, because it has the capabilities of patrolling um, in our own economic exclusive zone and our uh, threat center of gravity where will be the uh, fishery fleets that are doing illegal um, e IEU fishing uh, to and to address that threat we can do it by our own sources of power just to um, uh, as I, uh, I address in the example with the Chinese uh, uh, ship to through the critical capabilities but if we have or we want to defeat it it will be a uh, regional uh, approach where um, participation, the cooperation of uh, the other nations and its uh, information and, and, and resources. Uh, we began doing the Gallup exercise in 2019. I hope it will continue and go um, to prepare for, the, for this uh, threat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Okafar Yarwood, um, Continuing on the discussion regarding regional architectures and, and regional maritime organizations, you mentioned in your comments that there were six Western African countries uh, suffering high rates of monetary loss. 
do you see continued opportunities, particularly for that region with partnerships for regional architectures and regional maritime organizations and how those can be employed? Yes, absolutely. And, and this is actually my way of trying to emphasize the need for a more comprehensive um, response to security threats at sea, rather than the continued centering on piracy. So for example, the case of the Heilung Feng, that um, with the help of the Nigerian Navy and the Ivorian Navy, with the connection or communication between the own uh, architecture that actually resulted in the rescuing and capturing of pirates and the first ever successful legal um, prosecution of pirates um, with the support of UNODC, you know, with the legal support that they provided is testament of how the holistic approach can work, how the region can take advantage of the architecture that is already existing and then working with fisheries organization and collectively working holistically and not focusing only on piracy, but focusing holistically on threats at sea, whereby the Navy can be ready to work to capture pirates, but at the same time actively engaging with fishing agencies to communicate and then take advantage of the vessels or the assets they have to capture vessels that might have been engaging in illicit activities at sea outside piracy. So I think there's definitely an opportunity to take advantage of the collaboration within the architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last question I'll open either to Admiral Condannon or Commander Garzon is what role does Interpol play in sharing information and prosecuting IUU fishing in the international arena? Apologies, I had my mute on. Uh, so uh, so I, I, th I think Interpol is gonna be a very important organization as we go ahead. Uh, in, in this mission space, they have already formed uh, several uh, several work groups on IUU and uh, sharing information on best practices and investigations that they have already made uh, in, against uh, uh, IUU uh, companies and and uh, fishing uh, interests. But um, I can tell you that we in the Coast Guard have invested in that that we're going to send a uh, full time Coast Guard. Uh, investigative service agent uh, to be a part of Interpol specifically for the purpose to participate in those work groups. I think that'll be a, a very important collaborative tool. And um, I didn't mean to, to step in front of my Ecuadorian colleague if he, if he has a response on that. Um, thank you, Admiral. I just uh, add uh, as your response that the key is to have a trust between our nations, our governments, and then to share uh, information uh, wherever the source it, it is, and uh, also to address the common threat. So um, IUU fishing is a common threat. It will affect us all, not just uh, Africa countries, not just South American countries. When we don't have uh, what to eat, it will concern the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Our time today has come to an end, and we appreciate the time each of our distinguished panelists have taken to share their perspectives on IUU fishing, opportunities for regional collaboration and global collaboration, and the challenges facing human security. This concludes the panel, and we return to our conference organizer, Commander Cameron, for comments before the break. Commander? Thank you so much to Michelle Shallop, Rear Admiral Clendon, and Ife Okafor Yarwood and Carlos Garzon for talking to us in depth about IUU fishing. Overall, I'd like to thank all the speakers and moderators for our morning. It's been a truly rich learning environment for our global audience today. I'd like to welcome everyone back tomorrow at 0830 for a talk with Ms. Michelle Strzok, Principal Director of Stability and Humanitarian Affairs at the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. After her keynote, we'll have two important panels, one on unsafe mixed migration and modern slavery, and the second one on cultural heritage protection in the maritime environment. I have to thank again my conference co-organizer and the Captain Jerome E. Levy Chair of Economic Ge Geography, Professor Chris Jasparrow, as well as the Naval War College Foundation because they both sponsored this event today. 
That include, concludes the event for today. Thank you so much for joining us.